yesterday, we talked about some, uh, how do I phrase this? Some issues that people have with capitalism. Uh, free market capitalism, I should say, not just market capitalism. Like laissez-faire, zero government involvement. All right, so we, we moved from uh, the terrible economic systems of the past, from the Middle Ages and before, that were very oppressive and controlled you based on your group and uh, didn't allow individuals opportunity. Uh, so we definitely had an improvement with uh, uh, capitalism. Maybe not laissez-faire purely, no intervention whatsoever, uh, but it still had some benefits even under that system. So real quickly, remind me of some of the reasons why uh, this laissez-faire system in the West was better than all of the other uh, alternatives before it. Innovation. Okay, cool. It allows for innovation because uh, you're free to do what you want, fail or succeed. Nice, I like that. What's another reason why it's a, a benefit? An increase in wealth. Yeah, what do you mean by that? <clears throat> like. For who? For just, the, for just the highest classes? No, for like, just like the money supply in general, they increase because there's a, like, a larger like, flow of money going around. Yeah, okay, so we've got like a wealth creation system going on. And uh, let's not pretend like the, the people at the top didn't benefit disproportionately. They absolutely did. But we found that the income and uh, um, uh, standard of living for everybody has risen uh, as a result of this. So a net benefit for sure, okay. Speaking of standard of living, what do I mean when I say standard of living? Like if I compare a, uh, a poor person today compared to a poor person 150, 200 years ago. They have more access to resources and stuff they need. Yeah, so even uh, on the poorer end today, you have far more necessities than you do uh, 150 years ago. Uh, even the uh, uh, rich didn't have some of the stuff that the poor people have today. Uh, it's not difficult to acquire uh, your necessities and even some luxuries. And I actually saw a graph that shows the amount of money people spend on necessities uh, is like only about a third of their disposable income now. And it depends on uh, uh, where you're living exactly, but that's roughly what's going on. So uh, we actually have quite a bit of money to spare. Most of us, and even the uh, on the poorer end, you still have uh, what you need to live and survive. Cool. Increase in wealth, increase in standard of living. Right, and that gave us access to things like electricity for heating and cooling and cars for moving around. And there are environmental uh, impacts and issues, which we'll talk about later in the unit, but um, definitely better than starving and dying or, or freezing to death or, or, or not burning to death, dying of heat stroke, dehydration, things like that. Okay, <clears throat> cool, that's good for the pros. But there were definitely some cons with this laissez-faire system with no government involvement whatsoever. There were some issues that were very obvious uh, to people, and I don't want to uh, mislead you and pretend like this was every single company across every country in every situation. It wasn't, but uh, do people remember the things that are bad or good, generally speaking? If you're talking about people's memory, what sticks out more in their brain, the good or the bad? Yeah. The bad, definitely. We're way more sensitive to negative, right? So the 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 people that the people that are uh, suffering or the people that are taking advantage of people, uh, it's very noticeable. Even if it's not everywhere all the time for every person, it's still very noticeable. Um, that's what we remember, and that's what people report on too. Like for example, uh, if there's a, a shooting or a bombing or a war, or something bad happens, it makes the news, correct? Do they, does it make the news if a town has nothing bad happened on a day? It's like, and we're reporting here today from Lathrop where nothing happened, everyone just continued their lives nicely and everyone went home. Like, they don't report that stuff because it just happens every day. So um, the, uh, the, the bad sticks out a lot more, but I don't want to also underplay that uh, it was actually uh, very much true, and the people that were suffering uh, were genuinely suffering from the system. So what were some of the uh, negative aspects of this laissez-faire capitalism that people, uh, that we found we definitely need to actually get in uh, a little bit, get our hands dirty and intervene a bit? Okay, awesome. Yeah, so cons, and there are plenty. Uh, so cons are definitely going to be, uh, how can we phrase this? Working class, um, working class, not issues. We'll just write issues. All right, and then one of them definitely is the uh, working conditions. They're dangerous, unsanitary, 
So uh, getting sick and infected is commonplace. Getting injured, even killed on the job is uh, more common than it should be. Absolutely. Okay, what else are these workers and other, other problems? If a company monopolizes, they can do whatever they want. Yeah, okay, so if the government's not intervening at all, uh, that allows one business to sort of gobble up the others, whether it's legally or illegally, right, by just buying them out or bullying them out um, or stealing their stuff and, and making it seem like it was their own. Um, those sorts of things uh, kill competition. We need the competition to keep the prices low, the quality high, and um, allow for innovation. Because, I mean, companies don't have to innovate if we just can only buy their stuff anyway. All right, so that kills the uh, competition. Killed competition or competitive process, which you need for capitalism to, or free market economy to work. Oh, what about cronyism? Um, like people, like our companies would um, just bribe the state for like federal land. Yep. Instead of like um, optioning how they're supposed to. Yeah, exactly. So uh, they would bribe political leaders uh, to give them um, benefits, whether it was access to uh, land uh, when other companies should have been given the chance to auction on it and didn't. Like that, that's the Teapot Dome scandal with the uh, leasing for oil. Um, you also have like you know crooked tax breaks, um, access to uh, the land of materials, which we already mentioned. And then uh, regulation changes that uh, are not actually generally wanted or voted for, they're just purely bought uh, by businessmen. I'm gonna catch up on the people here. What else we got? Uh, unfair working hours or very long working hours. Mm -hmm. Long hours and days. Like too long, by the way. And not voluntary. It's one thing if I want to work overtime and get extra pay and all that, but it's another thing if my job requires me to work 12 to 14 hours a day, six days a week. That's totally different, all right? No one's really gonna argue against, oh, you're willingly going and working extra to make extra money? All right, you chose to do that, whatever. But if they're requiring it, uh, that's something entirely different. Absolutely, that's a bad thing. Okay. What else about these workers? Maybe one more thing, because we, there are others, but we, this is plenty. I'll get you two, don't worry. There we go. So I would tie that kind of in with uh, the government. Well, yeah. How can I phrase this? So <clears throat> often unions and strikes were banned or opposed, banned or opposed by government. So they either did nothing or if they did something, they actually helped the business end of it. Uh, why were they doing that, by the way? Why would a government intervene on behalf of the business or not at all? Yeah, exactly. They want that, that economic money cycle to go and economic growth to continue. Absolutely. Uh, and we have a couple examples of that, too. Uh, what are my uh, two examples of uh, strikes that went badly for the strikers because the government actually came in on the side of the business? The Pullman strike. And do you know that one? Uh, is this the one about the steel factory? It is. Yeah, the Homestead. Yeah, good. I'm glad that you remember that at least. Yeah. Homestead uh, uh, Massacre and the Pullman strike are two examples of that. Sweet. Okay. So that's kind of a, a, um, a summary of some of the negative aspects of laissez-faire. And again, when I say laissez-faire, I mean no government involvement at all. And we have found that that doesn't work because you have a lot of these um, uh, negative developments. And they're not good for anybody. Uh, in fact, it actually breaks the way the system's supposed to work in the first place with uh, bribery and monopolies. And then, of course, we don't want people intentionally make, being made to suffer just so a business can be slightly more efficient. Uh, there definitely has to be some sort of trade-off there. Okay, all right, so that brings us to our next topic. Because again, uh, we're not only learning about economics and how it works. Uh, in this class, we're working, we're learning like uh, why it is the way it is today. Like you don't, the way that the economy we have today is not just some arbitrary thing somebody made up out of the air. And if we don't like it, we can just replace it. Uh, because we're slowly through history taking the parts that work and keeping them and trying to weed out the ones that don't work. All right, so throwing away a whole system that's hundreds of years old uh, and has been changed for, for the better, improve it, improved, uh, just tossing it out is a terrible idea because these things are incredibly complex. And we'll find out one of the reasons why we don't do that today when we talk about communism, which is exactly what I just suggested. They say, oh, it's the system, let's throw it out and start over uh, because we can make it better. And uh, it turns out they grossly underestimated uh, how much better they could make it. Okay, so if I want to change these things, and most people do, uh, I kind of have two options if I want to change them. 
Now, there's going to be more than two different theories and uh, alternatives for this, and we're not going to talk about all. We'll talk, we're going to talk about the most popular two. One of them ends up working over time, and one of them ends up absolutely not working and being completely devastating. All right, so what are my two options generally if I want to change something? So this is what it already this is what already exists. Um, what are my kind of two options for changing things as far as maybe the pace? Oh, I mean from a from a from a, a system per, per perspective. You're totally right. If I'm a worker and I want to change, I would definitely have to strike. But strikes are outlawed; they're banned, right, by the government. How could I change that? There's kind of two ways to do that, as far as how I want to use the government to uh, change things. Okay, yeah, making new laws. So, if I'm making new laws, am I throwing out the whole system in the trash? No. Uh, by making new laws, uh, I'm reforming it, right, piece by piece. And that way we can see, oh, let's, share, let's try this uh, law or policy. Oh, watch it for a little while. Did it work? Oh, no, it didn't. Let's take it out. Or, oh, it did work. Let's expand it or keep it. So, yes, you can go with a uh, uh, gradual reform. And, again, the idea here is you pass some form of law or, or, or change, and you wait. Why do you wait and see what happens, by the way? Do you know it's going to work? No. Could it make it worse? Yeah. It could. Could it do nothing at all? Yeah. yeah. Could it make it better? Yeah. But what do, you need to do, what do you need to do to find out if it does or it doesn't? You've got to observe it, like let it, you know, not fester, that's not the right word, uh, ferment, or yeah, play out. <clears throat> okay. Um, so that takes time. It's slow. It's definitely a slow process. Low. But that does allow you at least to see what works, what doesn't, remove it, uh, and, and sort of uh, uh, refine it over time. All right, that is one ref uh, approach that's going to be taken. Okay, what's my other option? Because that's option one. I guess there's three. One option is do nothing. Uh, and then this one is slowly change it over time by adding laws. What's my uh, third and probably most radical option? Throw everything out the window. What? Throw everything out the window. Toss it out the window, yeah. Okay, so if I was conservative, I would say do nothing, leave it the way it is. Uh, this is kind of a compromise, and then a, I don't even want to say liberal or, ra or, or progressive because that's not correct. I would say radical change would be uh, uh, replace it entirely, replace entirely. Okay, those are kind of my three options. Obviously, this is not going to work because people are not happy, and it's, uh, it is not going to work in the long run. Uh, this is possibility, but it's very slow, probably frustratingly slow. And this one is very quick, potentially. Oh, yeah, you got to go. Okay, so that's what we're going to focus on. These are the kind of two options we're talking about today. So the first one, which I'll highlight uh, in the second, which is later, we're going to talk about this one is, you could, I guess, call it gradualism or classical liberalism. Or class to look at it. Do you need to sign this or? No, I don't think so. You show your test thing. Uh, gradualism or uh, classical liberalism. For the radical one that tosses out the whole system and replaces it with a new one, a better one, that is not better in any way, uh, is going to be uh, communism, which we'll talk about. And we're not going to focus too much on these topics because uh, it is kind of a, you could even say these are government topics. Uh, you certainly probably at least talked about this one briefly at some point in world history or US history, I hope. Please, I hope you did. Um, so it'll be kind of a little review, which is why I won't sit on it for too long, but you should know why they wanted to try this and also why it didn't work. Because uh, there are still people out there um, that think that this is a good alternative. It's like, actually, no, we've tried this like 30 different times and it failed all 30 times miserably at different times in history in different cultures. So uh, we're pretty sure it doesn't work. And we are pretty sure this one does work because in all the places, for the most part, we tried this. It's been slow and frustrating and sometimes it didn't work and sometimes it did, but in the long run, uh, it ends up working. So I want to focus on this one first and I can probably start introing this and then we'll take a break after the second slide. So first one. Fixing the issues with the gradual uh, way. So I would say the countries that did this most clearly are probably uh, the countries of, well, at the time anyway, were called Great Britain or England or the UK. That's what it is now, the UK. Uh, and the US as well. 
there are other states, absolutely, that have not the United France. So right in there. Uh, there are other states that did, have uh, done this to a degree. Germany, um, although Germany's kind of flip flopped a couple times, um, they had the fascist um, uh, socialist state under the Nazis, and then they had communism in East Germany. But um, a lot of other Western states have done this. But the ones that have done it most consistently and gradually across time are probably these two. Um, and then, of course, from communist uh, countries, we've got a few examples that we'll cover for them. So uh, looking kind of at these two uh, to an example. So these ideas, particularly this one, uh, came from primarily a guy from Great Britain. His name was John Stuart Mill. And he had an excellent idea. This guy was way ahead of his time. Uh, this guy was calling for... Uh, women's uh, rights and suffrage, and I don't mean suffrage as in like they're suffering, I mean like the right to vote, um, in like the early 1800s, so like well over 100 years before anyone was seriously considering um, giving women uh, equal access to uh, the political sphere. Um, so here's his theory. A lot of the laws at the time, in the 1800s, late 1800s, um, especially in the United States, they are against the working class. Right? They're, they're pro-middle class. They either don't intervene in the economy, or if you do, you help out the businesses, not the people. All right? um, in fact, they actually think that's a good thing. They don't want to help the uh, poor classes out. They think that's a bad thing. Why did they think that was a bad thing? They actually thought you were immoral. Not all of them, but some, several people thought that it was immoral actually to help the poor out, and it was a moral thing to let the, uh, the wealthy and the successful keep going. Yeah, exactly. So you have some social Darwinist beliefs. John Stuart Mill is one who would be very much against social Darwinism. So social Darwinism says, oh, uh, the uh, rich are doing the best because they are superior, like their work ethic's better or they're smarter or whatever. So uh, the way evolution works is you let the uh, strong uh, thrive and continue and you let the weak <coughs> perish. So that was kind of their, their strategy. Um, and as a result, they were okay with these uh, laws where the middle class would just allow no regulations or stop the working class from actually striking or, or unionizing. All right. So how could I get the government to change that? So let's think first of all, who's in the government? Who's actually running these countries? Who can afford to uh, give up a, a, a job or at least partly and go uh, to Washington or whatever state capital you have and, and help make laws? Who could afford to do that? The middle class, yeah, so it's a, a big issue. So for the most part, in the 1800s, the only people that really could actually even run in the government were either, if you're in Europe, uh, nobility that are already there, or uh, the middle class ran governments for the most part. So John Stuart Mill has a great idea. Uh, are the nobles in Europe, or the middle class in Europe <coughs> and the United States, are they gonna like, do they care necessarily about the, uh, the plight of the uh, working class and how they're having a rough time? No, not necessarily. Some do, but uh, not enough to. How could I change that, though? How could I change it so that a government does care about the working class? You elect middle the working class into the government. Yes, exactly. Working class people in most of Europe, well, most of the world, in all of the world, actually, uh, didn't even have a vote. So if you, were a, uh, if you didn't own property or you didn't match a certain income or, or, or didn't pass a literacy test, whatever it might be, um, you couldn't vote in the first place. So his idea is, well, we've got a lot of working class people. In fact, they way outnumber these guys. So if we want them to get some changes, but not just all the changes they want, kind of like a, a negotiated change with us, we have to allow them to participate in the government. They should either be able to be a part of the government with us, if they can afford to, or they should at least have a say in who they're voting for, all right? Because that way, if I'm in a city and I elect a representative to go there and make laws for me, uh, and let's say he's super middle class and hates the working class, I ain't going to vote for him. Who am I going to vote for? Yeah, I'm going to vote for anybody that does support the working class. Okay. Would you guess in most cities who outnumbers who, middle class or working class? Working class by a mile, right? So this is a, a, a great idea for allowing working class people to have a say in the government, whether it means they go there themselves or it means they vote for somebody who supports them. All right, so his idea is, and this is what classical liberalism is, classical liberalism, <coughs> it's to allow equal opportunity, meaning anybody can 
do anything. They're not limited by their race or gender or class or income or things like that. He thinks everyone should be able to vote. And that way, they can either run for the government themselves and get in there and, and help make laws or discuss them or change them, or they can vote for somebody who does support uh, their cause. All right, And that's going to be a, 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 a very important and, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Not relevant. Uh, significant development uh, in, the, uh, in the 1800s, because this is where we have the beginning. So this means, of course, anyone can vote, suffrage rights. Now again, they're not going to give this out um, uh, to women for a few decades, uh, even though he actually does, by the way, support that idea. But they are, in Europe and later in the United States, going to allow working class men, anyway, uh, to start voting. All right, And that's really going to change the game, because again, if I'm working class, now I can run for the government and get in there and tell people, oh no, I'm going to vote that down if you, if you put that bill up for passing, or I'm going to propose my own bill, or hey, if you want to pass that, you're going to have to change it and make it a little better for the working class, uh, or vice versa. So uh, this is going to uh, greatly help out the working class by adding what we call working class parties. Uh, parties that are centered around helping out uh, the working class, like making factories safer, uh, making conditions uh, that are for working or the hours you have to work safer, uh, trying to get rid of child labor, uh, trying to get rid of, what else could we, what do we want to get rid of? Oh, help them out with retirement. Um, require employers uh, to, uh, uh, or the state to pay for injuries at work, right? I don't mean injuries where like, I'm just like screwing around on my own at home and I hurt myself. I mean like, I'm on the job doing my job and I'm hurt by my job, like a piece of machinery or somebody else there or whatever, uh, that the should have paid for that. Um, so you got a couple examples. Uh, British Labor Party is probably a, a good example. Uh, in the US, at least after the 1930s, the Democratic Party kind of uh, takes up the yoke of um, the working class, US, Britain, obviously. So again, I got two options. I can run for it myself, or I can vote for somebody who supports me. And again, voting is based on who gets the most votes. So if I'm somebody who wants to be a part of the government, I'm going to have to at least have some opinions or policies that work for uh, the working class, because they're the bulk of the voters, certainly uh, in specific areas. So I can't just ignore them anymore, because either they're going to be a part of the government or they're going to vote somebody in who supports them and starts changing some of these laws. All right. Uh, and I think this is an important development, too, because does this mean that all of a sudden the whole government's going to become working class and they're just going to go pro worker 100 percent across the board? No. no. Who's still going to be there, at least partly? Or the middle class, right. So what you're going to have to do is you're not going to have one party uh, just totally controlling everything and potentially ruining it. Because if you give total control to either side, they'll just go way overboard uh, for benefits for themselves like they were doing in the 1800s. So what it forces people to do is it forces the middle class and the working class not to just run things completely on their own and do whatever they want, but they have to compromise now. Right? They've got to hash out what can and can't be done. It's not going to be all pro-business anymore but it's not gonna be all pro workers either. They're gonna to have to come to agreements and compromises on certain things. So it's gonna take a long time because it's not like they just roll in and pass a law every week. It, it sometimes takes years for them to agree on exactly what that law should be so that both of them feel like uh, they are winners in the agreement, whatever it might be. Okay, so do you think that worked over time? I would say it did. Almost any historian would say that it did, largely, in the United States and Great Britain. So from the 1830s, when this really started in England, uh, and then it really started in the US in like the late 1800s, early 1900s, uh, we have a lot of reforms that almost all people would agree were good things. All right, so you have things like uh, they ban child labor. Why is it uh, important to ban child labor, by the way? Yeah, exactly. Children are way more likely to screw up and injure themselves or other people. Like, put a, put a seven-year-old a mile deep in a coal mine. What's going to happen? He's probably going to die, but even worse than just him dying, that's awful enough. What, what's, uh, what could happen in a mine that is particularly uh, uh, dangerous beyond just his own life? They could, like, fall in or something. They could, and falls in their or... Mess up, mess up, like, the structure and everything just 
if, exactly, yeah, they could be responsible because they're way more likely to screw up than an adult. They could be responsible for an entire mind collapsing, right, and then killing or, 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 or damaging uh, all of the, uh, killing all the people and damaging the equipment, all that stuff. So uh, having child labor laws is, is a very important uh, part of making sure not only kids are safe um, and able to be kids, uh, but also uh, saving the adults through there as well. So they ban child labor. They, uh, I know this doesn't sound particularly awesome, but it's better than 12 to 14 hour days. They issue a 10 hour uh, maximum for work. So if a company, they can't force you to work more than 10 hours a day, you can choose to work overtime, but they have to pay you extra for that. Uh, they also have things like um, um, pensions, whether it's the uh, uh, state or the company that has to do it. A pension's retirement, by the way. Uh, that's where part of your paycheck, uh, or your taxes anyway, go to this big fund where workers are contributing, or the government, or your company, a little bit of money, into this giant pot of millions of dollars or billions of dollars. And that just sits there. And then when workers go through, they've worked 30 years, whatever, and they retire in their 50s or 60s, guess where that money starts going? To the retired people, right because they can no longer work. Did they already do the work? They did, they already contributed to this thing. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, it's so a worker insurance. So if you're on the job, the company has to pay for it, or the government helps you out. Uh, they regulate safety for uh, 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 food and sanitation. Uh, Jacob Reese and Upton Sinclair were a couple guys that either took pictures or wrote books and stories about how terrible these factories were, so people knew about it and wanted to change the laws. And like you asked, uh, they have antitrust laws, which are trusts are kind of like either a monopoly or a group of companies that works together to act like a monopoly. They made it illegal. Um, so, for example, um, what is illegal now would be for a certain company to own too much of a specific industry. Um, so if uh, like Microsoft or Apple or Amazon had too much of a certain customer base in an industry, whether it's delivery computers, whatever, uh, the government would actually force them to uh, either break up partly or they would not allow them to buy out any other companies. Uh, so that's, those are some examples of antitrust laws. Uh, industry regulation? That was the one I was talking about here, the, the safety and sanitation. So uh, for example, I think this was in US history, uh, or at least you should have covered it. There's a guy named Upton Sinclair He's a what's called a muckraker. He goes in and um, undercover to these factories and writes about how terrible the conditions are, uh, like how you know, like there's like rat feces in the meat, or uh, people are losing limbs and it's becoming part of the uh, ground up meat that's going out to people, or uh, just the fact that some of these things are rotting and, and all of that, uh, and the conditions of the workers. And then the books go out and people read about it and then they're totally appalled and then they go in and make these uh, changes in the government that you know, require government inspectors to come over and if they don't meet those inspections, they shut down your factory and all that. That's actually the reason why, if you notice at restaurants, they have a grade on their front uh, window. They have to, it's just like an A or a B or a C or a D or whatever. That's what the, uh, uh, the local or state or federal uh, inspector has given them for, for health and sanitation. So if they have like, expired things or they aren't properly storing things or they aren't um, uh, employees aren't washing their hands or whatever uh, they actually uh, go down a grade so you are aware of how clean or not clean they are and if they score too lowly they actually get shut down and have to reform or they go out of business so that's all part of this intervention uh, that was necessary but it wasn't quick it took decades to do because these two sides kind of have to squabble over what's acceptable or not because again, you're not going to be all pro-business, but you're also going to be all not pro-working class. Because if you just let the working class pick everything, they'll run the businesses out of business. The cost of production will be too high, and it'll actually make things worse. So they, they have to like meet in the middle uh, and find out, okay, so these are definitely acceptable uh, for both sides, and they help both sides, so they pass them. Uh, and if something is too severe, it gets taken out or it doesn't pass in the first place. All right, so we got that with the working class reforms. All right, and that's essentially what we call classical liberalism, allowing everybody uh, to have a vote, which means either you can be a part of the government and effect change, or you can uh, vote for people who side with you. And again, if you're the working class, you've got numbers on your side, you can vote in quite a few people. All right, that is the, uh, the realistic, gradual, classical liberal approach, and that has drastically improved uh, conditions in the world, certainly, uh, and the West. And we'll talk more about that too. Uh, um, in the next uh, week or two.